Hello and welcome to a special episode, a collaborative episode between Social Media Docs, Somi Docs, and Daily Remedy. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Jeffrey Singer, Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute who focuses on health policies and health studies. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Singer. Thank you for having me. Dr. Singer, you and I have known each other for quite some time and we've had many conversations together. But for the audience who may not be acquainted with who you are and what your work is, would you mind going into detail around your career first as a surgeon, building a practice, and then getting into policy? Because I think it's important to set the context. Okay, well, I'm a general surgeon in private practice, um, and I've been in practice over 40 years now. Um, even when I was an undergraduate student, I always had a, a deep passion for uh, public policy in general, political philosophy. Uh, but of course, uh, once I got into medical school, I had to put all of that on a back shelf because it really wasn't time for much else. And then after that, same thing with residency and having a, raising a family. And, and I started a, back in the uh, early 80s when I got out of my residency program. In those days, it was commonplace. Everybody would just start a solo practice. And particularly in Ari I'm, I'm originally from New York. I went to undergrad and med school in New York, but I came out to Phoenix, Arizona at a time when it was a, probably about three or 400,000 people. Now it's three and a half million in a metropolitan area. Uh, because I saw the, uh, I always wanted to live in the Southwest, and I, I also saw the, the growth and, and promise of, of Phoenix, and I got busy right away. Eventually, uh, as the practice grew, uh, it became too much for one person to handle, and so two other solo surgeons with whom I developed a coverage relationship, and we were different generations, but we really had a good chemistry. We actually liked each other personally and would assist each other and bounce tough cases off of one another and give each other honest advice as to how we'd handle it. So we decided to merge and we created, to my knowledge, the first group surgical practice back in the 80s. That was very unusual in those days. I mean, there were primary care doctors who would do that and OBGYNs, uh, you know, but very few surgeons, in fact, our, our attorneys and accountants have advised us against it. They said, surgeons are cats, they're not dogs, they don't get along well in these settings. Uh, but we, 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 like I say, we were friends, so it worked out very well, the practice continued to grow, and eventually it grew to the point where now we're over 11 surgeons, uh, plus a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, and uh, as we grew, we were able to take personal time. Being a little atypical, I guess you would say, my two original partners, both of whom are no longer in the practice, one passed away and one re-retired, um, uh, they would do what normal people would do on their personal day, you know, maybe play golf, uh, get a haircut, visit friends, do some socializing. I look use that as an opportunity to get back into my other passion. I was still keeping abreast, reading different journals and, and books. And sort of, I was, I was, I was always self-identified as a libertarian. That's with a small L, not libertarian party. And so I was getting a lot of libertarian literature. I was kind of part of the movement, so to speak, but obviously in the periphery because I was busy working as a doctor, but now I had more time to do that. So I started getting more involved. I started participating in ballot initiatives in my state of Arizona, like uh, the initiative to legalize medicinal marijuana in the mid nineties. Um, and uh, eventually I became an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute uh, in the early 2000s. Um, and then uh, as I reached uh, uh, my mid sixties, you know, with my young children all grown up with their own families and all my obligations met. My wife and I are empty nesters, had a lot more free time and I was kind of ready for a change. So uh, I approached the Cato Institute and said, instead of being an adjunct, what, what do you think about hiring me to be a full-time scholar? Because there aren't too many DC-based think tanks that, that do health policy that have actual physicians on their staff who actually take care of patients. They have some who are retired or administrative type doctors or public health uh, officials. And then most of them are not even in medicine. They're, you know, lawyers or political scientists or economists. And they saw the value of that. So they hired me. And then I spoke to my partners and, and worked out an arrangement with them. So uh, I told them, you know, beginning at the end of the year, I'm, I'd like to take a back seat in the practice and just do part time. So I work two days a week, I'm only doing uh, low risk sort of out, outpatient type surgeries, you know, like 
hernias, laparoscopic gallbladder surgeries, things where the patients are not going to need to be in the hospital because um, it wouldn't be ethical for me to, to do complex cases and not be able to give them my undivided attention since I have to make frequent trips to Washington or on behalf of the Cato Institute. And the rest of the time I work, uh, I work out of my house mostly um, because my practice is in Phoenix, so Cato allows me to work remote. They, and they, until COVID, they kind of frowned upon remote, but now, like a lot of institutions, they've kind of adapted. So uh, they have a number of people who they allow to work remote, but we have to make frequent trips to Washington. And so that's where I'm at right now. And um, most of my uh, involvement in the healthcare policy space, because I'm a doctor, um, it kind of made sense for me to get involved with the uh, the overdose crisis, which you can't uh, uh, discuss in a vacuum. You have to talk about if you're going to delve into the causes of the overdose crisis, that gets you into the whole issue of drug prohibition and the war on drugs and how that contributes to it. So uh, I would say more than half of my uh, research activity is devoted to that. And then the other area that... Uh, I bring a unique perspective to, and that uh, that I work on at, at Cato. Actually, most healthcare economists uh, do this as well. But my uh, my director at the Cato Institute, Michael Cannon, who's an economist, thought it would be more appropriate for me, a doctor, to do this. So I work in areas like uh, expanding scope of practice of so-called mid-level health practitioners, which I would favor. Uh, many licensing laws, of course, restrict what other health professions can do. There's a whole lot of turf battles that go on. And if we're interested in expanding access to healthcare, you know, this is the 21st century. It's not a hundred years ago. Uh, there are a lot of other health professionals who are much more, much more sophisticated training these days and are qualified to do a lot more than a lot of scope of practice laws allow them to do. And with the, with the shortage of, uh, of, of uh, healthcare providers in general. I mean, the average wait now just to see uh, a PCP as a new patient is 26 days, I understand. Uh, the more we can do to allow other health professionals to practice the full extent of their training, the more we could do, we could mitigate some of the uh, access problems. Well said. As you know, the title of this series is Stigmatized. So while I feel it's very important to go over the policies and some of the ramifications in advocating policy positions, I want to start more broadly and just discuss the concept of a physician entering into policy and some of the uncomfortable moments you might have experienced as you made that transition. Did you ever feel like perhaps your colleagues may not understand why you're going into policy or that you are in some way, and again, this is back in the 80s and 90s, a different era of medicine, perhaps in some ways not remaining true to your oath or your mission as a physician. Did that ever arise? Uh, it never arose that I was not being true, uh, true to my oath as a physician. A lot of people, a lot of my colleagues uh, probably, uh, understandably, didn't didn't delve as deeply into political philosophy and and healthcare economics and public policy as, as I did. You have to have an interest in that. So they tended to simplify things and just assume that, you know, I was interested in quote unquote politics. In fact, people to this day say, you know, I was wondering, when are you going to run for office? I mean, you're so political. And I keep telling them I'm not political. The reason I haven't run for, I actually say this, and they're starting to get it. I say, the reason I haven't run for office is because I want to make a difference. <laughs> and I honestly mean that because uh, I think it's compromising to run for office. So this isn't like self-aggrandizing. This is just the passion I have for doing, doing the right thing and leaving a mark. And understandably, uh, most people, they, they, you know, doctors are very smart, but most people, uh, there's so much to know and keep up with in medicine that they, they tend to kind of have their all of their mental cognitive energy kind of focused in in that medical channel. And it, it, I think it's unusual, although we're seeing more and more of it uh, for physicians to want to get into other disciplines. Uh, so they never viewed they, they viewed me as, quote, political uh, without knowing the nuances of it. And then some of the positions that I've taken over the years, uh, they, they, like, for example, my positions for expanding scope of practice, they viewed me as sort of a traitor. Hmm. How could you advocate 
uh, allowing nurse practitioners to practice independent of uh, a collaborative agreement with the doctor, uh, you know, or uh, believe in uh, independent practice authority for for CRNAs, nurse anesthetists, and and, and the like. Or now I'm advocating for uh, allowing uh, uh, doctor level clinical psychologists who've done extra training in, in uh, clinical psychopharmacology to be, to be able to prescribe psych meds, as now is the case in seven states and the U.S. military and the public health service and the Indian health service. So um, a lot of them view, view me as, uh, as a traitor. In fact, when I wrote an op-ed in Arizona's Repu the Arizona Republic, the major newspaper in our state, back during the pandemic, Governor Ducey, uh, uh, authorized allowing CRNAs to practice independent of physicians. Mm. Uh, and uh, the uh, Arizona Anesthesiology Society was uh, very upset about that. His, his reasoning was this expanded access. A lot of Arizona is very rural, um, and people sometimes have to drive four or five hours to a big city where there's doc there are doctors available. And uh, and if, if you added to the pool of, of people who could do uh, ambulatory anesthesia, like, you know, in outpatient surgery centers, that would help. So uh, I wrote an op-ed saying, you know, I've worked with CRNAs for years. Uh, when I did my residency, they're in the VA system, they're in the military, I don't see what the problem is. I caught so much flack from anesthesiologists that I've worked with for decades. One of them, though, who he and I have had some interesting conversations, so he knows me quite well, when we ran into each other, he uh, he said, Jeff, how could you have written that? It's like I was a traitor. And I said, Scott, how many years do you know me? Does it, did it surprise you that I wrote that? And then you can say, eh, I guess not. But there were some doctors who were literally, uh, I was, I, they were, they were calling me all sorts of uh -huh. uh, expletives and they were very angry with me. Some were refusing to give, provide anesthesia to my outpatient surgeries over it or some just sarcastically would pull me aside and say, can you trust me to give anesthesia to this patient that you have scheduled? Because I'm not a nurse practitioner, I'm a doctor. And I sarcastically would say, oh, Mike, I know you for years. I think you could do it. That would be my answer. Um, it, it's helpful that I'm at a point in my career where I'm, uh, you might say, uh, a little bulletproof. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, many doctors at my stage of career have retired. I I haven't retired, but I, I don't feel as uh, beholden to pleasing my referral sources and to making and to being well liked in in my in the, among the physician community. Although I would like to be liked, everybody likes to, to be liked. Yeah. But 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 you know, twenty years ago, if I was uh, ruffling feathers with some of my positions, it would worry me that it was going to hurt my practice. Um, I'm very fortunate also with the connections I made. So, for example, in the 1990s when I started using my free time to get involved, and I got involved with the Medical Marijuana Initiative in Arizona in 1996. Before I did, I was actually contacted by the campaign and asked if I'd be willing to do some TV commercials uh, in support of it. And, well, that's public. So I, I spoke to my partners, the ones I merged with, and I said, before I say yes to this, how do you guys feel about this? Because this is going to impact our practice. And I was very lucky because they said, what you do on your time is your business. Just don't mention Valley Surgical Clinics, okay? Just say mm. you're a doctor in Phoenix. And then, so I said, okay. So that's how I did it. And uh, I, I was visible on television a lot. And I thought that was, I was worried that was going to hurt the practice. To my pleasant surprise, it actually helped the practice. We were getting people coming from the exurbs to our practice with, uh, for example, breast cancer. I'm not talking about, you know, young people looking for an ex a prescription to get medical marijuana. I'm talking about uh, people who are older, who had serious problems. They're coming to see me and I say, well, you live all the way in Mesa. Why did you come drive an hour and a half to get to see me? There are plenty of doctors you passed along the way. And I say, well, I saw you in that commercial on television. And I thought anybody who's willing to stick his neck out on this must really care. I want that doctor. Hmm. So it actually, hmm. to my pleasant surprise, it, it worked. And so throughout my my whole life, though, that's I, I always do what my conscience tells me to do. The uh, as when far does as it cost you? you? When has it ever cost you? When does policy and 
taking a certain position ever affected you to the point where you questioned, is this truly worth it? You and I know each other well, and I know you have very strong convictions and very inner, very high level of inner strength. But I'm just curious to know, perhaps early in your career, or perhaps when you were not as established, were there ever moments where you felt like it's going to cost me, or what am I doing? Those moments of self doubt. Uh, well, I'll be honest with you, and you, I waited to the right time to do a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. So, well, first of all, the first 15, 20 years, I didn't have a lot of time to do anything except build the practice and, and, and do my work as a doctor. Uh, but then when I, when I initially got involved, uh, I would generally get involved with issues that were less controversial among practitioners. And I waited until I was at a, a my practice had matured to the level where, where I was well known in the community, and uh, um, most of my colleagues thought of me already as sort of a, you know a very very passionate, but maybe uh, maybe a little different in some of my views, and they were tolerating that. And that's when I as so I was kind of I, I I would kind of time when I would introduce mm -hmm. more controversial positions. I would, I would some some things I would hold off on. That didn't mean I, I wouldn't. Uh, if, if, if I was asked, I would say how I, I believe I wouldn't lie, but whether I wanted to, to take a public position and, uh, on certain things, you wait, you wait until certain times in your career where it could do less harm. Because also I had to uh, keep in mind, I had partners too, and, yeah. uh, and a good relationship with them. And I didn't want to, to do anything that was going to make them feel that it's affecting them. That wouldn't yeah. be right. So. Uh, I had to wait as well to, to the point where now I'm the mm. senior partner and, mm. you know, I, I'm a little more insulated. This concept of timing, I think, is very important because it highlights some of the problems other physicians, or not perhaps problems, but other dilemmas that physicians may be going through as a transition into policy. This aspect of knowing when to discuss openly or publicly on certain issues, did that come from a certain understanding of policy, did that help you then determine what policy stances made the most sense to you clinically? Did that all kind of configure into the stances that you now take? Well, um, it's important to understand the policy and also understand what other people think about it. Because, uh, so I, I, I've always made it a point of not just uh, knowing what I think and be and feeling I could I could you know justify it, but I want to know what the uh, the arguments are against it. And particularly, you know, you hear about steel man versus straw man, and I want the steel man arguments. I want arguments that uh, the, the tough arguments that I that make me have to question whether I'm right or not. Because uh, so so that that that's part of getting involved. In, in policy and, and public affairs. Um, and then so that, that, that would also, because of that knowledge, because of that time I took for that, it would help me decide when was a good time to introduce something. Because I already had a kind of a, a finger on the pulse of what not only opinions in my profession were, but what the general public opinions were. So, you know, there are some things you could say that, that you knew right off the bat, oh, this is going to make everybody think I'm crazy. Where there are other things you could say where, where you think, you know, if I put it the right way, I bet you I can get a, a very significant amount of people to see, at least to see I'm making a point. Yeah. So, you know, those kind of things are all part of your decision as to when to introduce new things, especially if your primary uh, focus is your medical practice, which it had been up until, like I say, recently when I went back, to, when I cut back to part time. You had mentioned you were libertarian, small L, and that you're more into policy than politics. But you also mentioned that people often oversimplify and typecast you. Medicine tends to have a left leaning focus, often physicians who are perhaps libertarian are deemed right-leaning in their outlook, wrongfully or rightfully, and they're often typecasted as such. Can you give a few examples in which you felt you made a very articulate argument, but just because of how you were positioned or how you were perceived, that argument was overlooked and you were then typecasted? Um, yeah, in the early days, uh, it was actually medicine was more right-leaning, so up until the last maybe 20 years or so. So, uh, mm. 
when I was taking my positions uh, as a libertarian for things like medicinal marijuana or uh, against the war on drugs, those kind of positions, um, many of my colleagues uh, actually uh, were, they thought I was crazy. They were, they were very vehemently opposed. A lot of them accused me of being a lefty, quote, quote unquote. Uh, in more recent years, uh, those kind of positions actually more res resonate better with my col colleagues, harm reduction, those kind of things. Um, but yeah, there's a tendency for not just doctors, everybody in general has a tendency yeah. to, to stereotype and there's, stereotypes play a role. I mean, they're a cognitive tool that help you quickly just generally categorize people. But, uh, when it comes to, uh, to, uh, the left, right paradigm, I think that's an outdated paradigm that has its roots in the 19th century and in, in the French assembly actually. <laughs> And it doesn't apply, especially now, and I think at this particular point in American and Western uh, history, uh, there's a realignment going on. So we're seeing all sorts of new sorts of coalitions forming. So, and libertarianism was always, uh, always kind of not part of the right or left. So, for example, on on the so-called social issues or on criminal justice, foreign policy, uh, libertarians always had views that align more with people up until you know who when i was growing up you would have identified stereotypically as being on the left but then on issues dealing with uh taxation regulation uh you know government intervention in the economy uh libertarians have views that more align with the right so uh oftentimes and during the maybe the 70s 80s and into the early 90s it all depends on what issues were sort of front of mind. So a lot of the issues front of mind in those days were more economic, fiscal type of issues. And so uh, libertarians often were lumped in with conservatives. But now in more recent years, as other issues, uh, a lot of culture war issues and, uh, and, and the like, and drug war and criminal justice, libertarians are many times uh, lumped in with the left. In fact, you know, we're just consistent <laughs> for individual liberty and uh you know right down the line i've had the uh the, the privilege in the in 2023 of uh invi being invited as the witness by the democrats to testify before the house judiciary committee now when you're invited by them that means your obviously your views are aligning with the members the majority on that in that caucus uh so as and when you're usually the other party tries to discredit you and the the party that invited you throws you softballs. And uh, so I was invited by the Democrats to testify in March. And then in September, I was invited by the Republicans to testify uh, before the House Oversight Committee. So and 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 that's kind of as a libertarian and at the Cato Institute's a libertarian think tank that that's pretty typical. And that's exactly where we want to be. We want to be not thought of as on the right or left but we have our own distinct viewpoints and that we align with both left and right, depending on what the is issue is. And we're an honest broker. So we can enjoy intellectual uh, exchange with both people on the left and people on the right and in a, in a civil way. And that's, that's what we try to do. Talk to us about that experience and testifying in Congress, whether that's a subcommittee or the general body. What are the emotions that are going through your head before you start, right before you're about to speak? Do you ever get nervous or perhaps apprehensive with some of the questioning that may come your way? Yeah, the first the first time the, the, was before the uh, House Judiciary Committee, Subcommittee on Government and Criminal Surveillance. I mean, crime and government surveillance back in March of 2023. I never had done this before. I had done some, re during the pandemic, I'd done some remote testimony, but that's different. You're sort of protected a little bit. You're, you know, you're sitting at your computer in your house and nobody has to know if you're fidgeting. <laughs> <laughs> so here, you, you know, you got to dress nice, your body language is important. So I, I, it was a new experience. And any doctor listening to this podcast will, probably appreciate if you've ever been through a deposition, which most doctors eventually will be uh, deposed at, at least once in their career, you kind of have an idea what it's like. You, you, you really, uh, it, it's mentally very uh, tense. You're focusing on every word that's that asked of you. You don't want to be misinterpreted. You want to misspeak. Um, and you also don't want to be thrown 
uh, something that you weren't prepared for. So I prepared a lot and I was very, uh, it was draining. Um, but, uh, but I also, uh, I'll tell you this in a minute, I learned about it. I learned something about it so that the next time when I was testifying, I was actually less nervous. You're always focused. You're, you're having, you know, you want to pay attention to every question and answer exactly the way you want to answer it. Um, and you, you know that the, the uh, people who are opposed to your views are going to try to throw gotcha questions at you. So you're ready for that. You hopefully are ready for it. If you're not and you get an obvious gotcha question, you're angry with yourself because you should have been ready for that. But the the other thing I learned is, and this is a, a sad testimony, is that uh, in many cases, the witnesses are props in political theater. Uh, this um, is, is, to me, is very cynical, but it's true. So that, for example, uh, my experience on bo in both testimonies was that the, the members of the committee who are hearing you, they already have pretty much their minds made up. Now, ostensibly, this is supposed to be a committee that's fact-finding. They, they're both uh, the Democrats and the Republicans and the, indep and the independents that are on the committee. They're all interested in one thing, getting at the truth and, and helping to come up with the best legislative uh, answer to address this issue. That's what it's supposed to be and that you're supposed to be really interested in hearing all different viewpoints. It's almost like a war room, you know, like when the when the president is assembling all of his advisors and has to make a huge decision, and you want a little bit of an argument because you need to figure out you, the, what's the best way to go. But that's not really what it is. They already have their minds made up in advance, and each side invites experts who are going to basically validate their views. And that's that's what I what I found out. Um, I mean, it was clear even from conversations before the meeting got underway, and that was kind of that's what made it actually less less tense for me the second time around because I learned that on the first uh, testimony. So by the time the second testimony came, I already understood. Okay, I'm not going to change any minds here today. I, I was naive enough to think I had a chance to change minds on my first testimony, but now I know I'm not going to change any minds. I'm just here to make the best case for the people who invited me because they agree with my argument. Mm -hmm. And and that took some of the pressure off in a, in a way, to be honest with you, because, and I also understood that anybody who's attacking me, well, first of all, they I must say, because I'm a doctor, that that, that helped. Uh, both sides tended to be polite to me as a doctor. They, they, they weren't uh, mean-spirited, but they the, those who disagree with me would vehemently disagree with me. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, like I said, I thought when I when I first came there that maybe I could change some minds, but you realize afterwards that that that's not going to happen, and so, uh, but nevertheless, you know, it may be on C-SPAN, it may get coverage in the news, so I use this as my opportunity to basically persuade people out there who might be watching, not the members of the committee. They already know what they want to do. I'm so there's a I'm talking to the camera and maybe people out there listening, sort of like people watching this podcast, maybe I could change some minds that way. And that's, and that's the way I approach it. That's very interesting. It's almost as though it's an opportunity to get jaded, but you're then seeing the value in what that opportunity would bring. And that raises an interesting point because in medicine, particularly in the clinical realm, people talk about physician burnout in the sense of feeling jaded about clinical practice. Is there a similar sentiment in the world of health policy that you perhaps could get jaded in recognizing some of the things may be more pageantry than truly policy, or do you find value creation opportunities? Um, I that's kind of a complicated question. If by jaded you mean um, you're less uh, of a less idealistic, uh, I'm I'm not any less idealistic. The only reason I do this is because I believe this is the right thing to do. Uh, but I'm less naive, so mm -hmm. that before I started getting the chance to talk to lawmakers, and, and both in the state and, and, and national level, uh, I was under the, maybe, you know, I, I had the impression of them the way you get from watching movies and television shows. So I had Hollywood's... Uh, <laughs> Hollywood's idea of uh, of these are all dedicated statesmen who uh, want to do the right thing, and uh, but it it didn't take long for me to realize that uh, in and there, there are 
don't get me wrong, there are some elected officials who at least they went there with the right uh, intentions, but there's so much uh, uh, kind of team sports, <laughs> intramural sports going on, and all these divided, there's, you have to be loyal to your caucus, and, and if you want your proposal ever to be heard, then you're going to have to support this proposal of mine that you don't agree with, because uh, otherwise the, your proposal that, that I have control over on the agenda won't see the light of day. And there's a whole lot of that going on. So um, in that respect, if you say jaded, my my understanding of how the political process works is more jaded. But my commitment to what I think is right or wrong is, is as strong as ever. Uh, and, and But it also, I think it's useful too, because when you're talking to some uh, politicians or staff, um, you're also aware that they themselves, they even if they privately uh, agree with you, they're under all sorts of pressures, uh, external pressures, including political considerations and re-election concerns that compromise their ability to just uh, follow your advice. And um, in the early going when you're doing this, uh, you're very disappointed because you thought you had such great advice and nobody's listening to you. But as you get more experience, uh, you know, you just realize, well, you know, if somebody takes 10% of my advice, okay, that's good. That's better than 0%. And, you know, maybe uh, maybe I move the needle a little bit in the right direction. So you, it affects your attitude. Your attitude is much more realistic, let's say. Well said. And because I've known you for so many years, I can truly attest to just how much sincerity you have in the policies that you advocate and the work that you do. So that goes without saying in my book. I want to transition and maybe make the remaining time that we have uh, more supportive for those in the medical world, physicians, physician administrators, who are looking to get into policy, but may have certain concerns or certain fears, trepidations. When I look at you and your transition, I see somebody who had the personality and the intellectual acumen to get into policy and weather the storm. Perhaps certain physicians may not have the personality type, though they may have the intellectual acumen. Do you have any advice to give to those physicians who may have very good policy advice, but are just too scared to put themselves out there? Well, yeah, and it, 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 again, a lot of a lot of it depends on individual circumstances. I was very fortunate to have entered practice at a time when I was basically my own boss, and then I had partners who were great partners. Uh, a lot of those kind of opportunities don't exist in, in modern medicine, where you can come out, start your own practice, and be willing to, you know, say, "Well, I, this means a lot to me. I'm willing to take a risk and maybe even take a hit to my practice's income, because this is worth it to me." Because when you're employed, you can't make that decision, but you can get fired. So, so I don't want to impose, uh, m you know, my standards on a lot of modern doctors. A lot of the opportunities that existed in, when I was coming out don't exist today. Um, but generally speaking, um, uh, if I had a, and I've gotten doctors ask me who are, have a similar interest that I do, say, how did you do it? Give me advice. Uh, and my advice would be to, uh, um, you know, start getting involved first on your local level on issues that mean a lot to you. For example, uh, writing op-eds, maybe uh, getting involved with, there are some organizations like state level organizations, like think tanks, like in my state, we have the Goldwater Institute, it's a free market think tank. I got very involved with them in the early going in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and, uh, and and just get it, kind of test the waters, you know, get involved with uh, certain projects and see what the reaction is, see how much time it takes away from your medical practice. And also, uh, it's amazing how, how your skills improve, because when you first get into this, your, your writing technique, particularly your persuasive writing technique, you know, writing to persuade, that may not, that you've never done that before as a doctor. So, so uh, uh, the, the first couple of go arounds, you might not be that good, but then you start getting, you know, practice makes perfect. So you start getting better and better at it. Um, and then uh, in my case, what what I did, which if you're able to do that, uh, if you could take a position uh, as an adjunct at some organization that means a lot to you, 
uh, an adjunct usually means uh, obviously you're, you're not getting paid, um, but you're like uh, on their sort of on their auxiliary staff where uh, they call upon you once in a while. If your time permits, could you do this for us? And every once in a while, you write something, and because of your relationship, you say, could you do me a favor? Could you help me get this published? So that kind of thing. And do that for a while, and then just see where things lead. I mean, in my case, it was organic. It just I started off just getting active in the 90s, and that led to an adjunct position, and that led to me at one point in my life deciding, you know, uh, I think I'm ready for a basically a, a, a career change, a shift. I mean, I, I'm not ready to this moment to give up medical practice, but, but right now, uh, where it used to be that I was devoting, you know, most of my focus to medical practice and a little bit on the side to public policy, now it's most of my time to public policy and a little bit on the side to medical practice. And for ethical reasons, of course, like I'm not taking on some of the more major surgical problems because I don't have the time to yeah. devote to that. It wouldn't be right for the patients. So um, I, I guess that's the best advice I can give is if you're interested, get involved. Uh, local's better. Also, locally, uh, people know you better. So uh, the more people who know you, if you have uh, a heterodox viewpoint on something, the more they're willing to uh, you know, accept it. And tolerate it because they know you so they know you're not uh, a bad person or uh they know you personally so that that helped a lot in my case because most of my early involvement was in phoenix and arizona and even the people who disagreed with me didn't dislike me <laughs> and they knew me as a colleague and and on a strictly medical collegial basis we got along just fine it's just uh, if we ever got into a policy discussion we might suddenly part ways <laughs> it's interesting how you conducted yourself uh, early on and navigated the local landscape of policy making and then expanded. I think that's great advice for those who may be starting off, start local, build a local network, and then expand your skill sets from there. One point you mentioned earlier that I thought was very important was that you had unique opportunities like starting your own practice and having certain freedoms that physicians today who are employed may not have. But you still had partners, and I'm sure you still had some uneasy conversations. Without delving into details of those conversations or really getting into the nature of corporate medicine today, can you maybe give some high-level advice on how you structured those conversations, how you plan to address your partners, and what you wanted to get out of those conversations to take potential tensions, potential conflicts, and de-escalate as you start policy making? Yeah, now keep in mind, uh, even with all my partners, we are not this complex bureaucratic corporate structure that you'll see in hospital systems or in the private equity uh, situations that have acquired practices. So if I want to talk to my partners, I just walk over to the next office down, you know, in the corridor and pop in on them and say, hey, I was thinking of doing this. What do you think? It's a lot easier. Um, and everybody knows each other personally. But Generally speaking, there were uh, a number of times uh, where I was wanting to publicly take a position that it just, if, if you think this might negatively impact your practice, then that should right away tell you before you do it, you better check with, if, if it even entered your mind, that means that, that should be a red flag. So check with whoever you need to check with. In my case, it was my partners. And there were, uh, several times where they said, well, look, I don't want to tell you what, a lot of times actually they were agreeing with me, but even when they didn't, like I said, we were friends too. And they said, I don't want to tell you, you know, what position you could have, but, but for the sake of this case, would you please uh, just refer to yourself as a, you know, a Phoenix area surgeon, but don't, don't mention your affiliation with our practice because we're afraid it might have some blowback for all of us in the practice. So that's, uh, and, and so uh, there are a number of times where I was, you know, the byline would just say, Jeffrey Singer is a Phoenix area surgeon. And that was fine with me. I mean, I was glad they still let me do, do it. And if they, it never occurred where they say, we don't want you doing this. Uh, we're really afraid of the impact that it, it, it would have. I was lucky. I could see how it could occur. And particularly when it comes to corporate situations, the, the you know, the big, more aloof uh you know, C-suite type people where they don't know you, uh, uh, you're, in many cases, you're ex 
you're you're uh, disposable. You know, you're not indisposable. Like they could just get another doctor for your slot if you're a troublemaker. So yeah. they may be much more um, insistent on saying, no, you can't do this. As long as you're working for us, you can't get involved in this. And that may be an obstacle that a lot of doctors today w would encounter that I didn't. And uh, and so, you know, it's like I say, I don't want to put impose my standards on others because I was in a different situation. Yeah, well said. In the remaining time that we have, I want to get your advice on the concept of compromise. There's a saying, pick your battles. And it feels like much of your success comes from tactfully knowing when to take a strong stance, when to compromise, whether that's maintaining cordial relations or understanding the practical realities of testifying or serving as a witness. Talk a little bit about the concept of compromise and how to do it the way that you feel comes across as genuine and true to the cause you're trying to advocate for? Well, I think there's a difference between compromising your principles and compromising on a solution. They're, they're two different things. So I, I don't believe in compromising my principles. And in fact, uh, the Cato Institute's that way too. Uh, you know, we're a libertarian think tank and if everything was libertopia, so to speak, then you know we we would uh, some of the positions that we support some of the reform proposals that we support we wouldn't be supporting because we'd be more uh, you know either the absolute ideal or nothing so um, you could still have those principles and state them uh, or while at the same time uh, realize that you got to deal with a whole bunch of other people who don't see it your way and if you could at least move the needle in your direction that's progress so. For example, every time I write a paper for the Cato Institute, and this is the way it is for almost all the Cato scholars, when it, after we lay out the situation and lay out a policy proposal, then we come to, you know, at the end, policy recommendations for policymakers. And we always start off with, ideally, this should be the policy. And then let me explain why. But by that time, hopefully you'll know by the time you get to that part of the paper. And then we say, however, if that is not feasible, then the second best choice would be this. And explain it. And then if that is not feasible, then a third best choice would be this. And finally, if none of those are feasible, then at least do this. So you're not compromising your principles, but you're also recognizing rea reality. Yeah. And so you're laying out, you know, uh, but you're making it clear that when you uh, say that, you know, choice number four uh, is another thing you could do, but you're already letting everybody know that's not what your first choice is. That's your fourth choice. Yeah. You know. No, well said. And with that, Dr. Singer, as always, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me.